Today I have the pleasure of speaking with our own Jack Lipton. How are you today, Jack? I'm fine, Tracy. How are you? Well, I know I promised I wouldn't ask you this, but I can't resist. Jack, right. any final words on Molly Core since uh, you did call this? Uh, no, I, I actually, uh, they've sort of vanished from, uh, I don't think they're giving out public announcements right now. And I think the next thing is when they reappear in court next week for the next tranche of, of debtor in possession financing. So it's like a soap opera. We'll have to just tune in and see what happens next. Jack, you just wrote what I thought was an outstanding piece this week t titled China's Mental Markets Fear is Everybody's Worry. And you mm -hmm. had some... I thought you had some very important messages in here, including the fact that you wrote, the undeniable fact is that China, the world's most populous nation and the world's largest second economy, has now become the largest end user of technology, metals, and materials for the manufacturing of consumer goods in the world. I'd love for you to uh, expand on that, please. Uh, I, I still don't think that the average person in the West or maybe anywhere else is aware of the fact that China is the world technology metals uh, and materials market. At 60% of all metals and materials produced in the world <clears throat> are now going into China. How can we say whatever happens in China doesn't affect the entire market? The interesting thing to me is that if the Chinese market in demand increases, that's, of course, a very positive thing for, for non-Chinese raw material producers. If it decreases, it's a disastrous thing. So we're all hanging on what's happening in China. And it doesn't matter whether the U.S. economy, the European economy is up, down, sideways. These are not where the demand is for technology, metals, and materials. It's primarily China, Korea, India is coming along. The focus of demand is Asia, East Asia. And so let's start paying attention to what's going over uh, on over there in their economies. That's why when, when there's a glitch in an economy of a country like China, when they, when they sneeze, we all have to take penicillin. All right. And, and on that note, I think uh, you have been a, an avid supporter of topics on items such as rare earth recycling for North America. Yes. Yes. Would you mind just explaining this a little bit to our audience right now? I mean, where are we with rare earth uh, recycling? I saw uh, one professor from Pennsylvania on TV last week, never heard of him, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. talking about this. And uh, I'm aware of some recycling deals and some companies that claim they're going to be doing uh, tailing recycling. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about where that market is presently? My my uh, observation on, on that market is that it is the next logical market for the West. In, in other words, as, as a friend of mine who I won't identify, but he's from north of the U.S.-Canadian border, said to me last week, people are tired of digging holes in the ground and filling them with money. It's time to look at conserving what we use and recycling what we don't what we have used up Th this is this is definitely the future as far as all these announcements about recycling they they've been there for the last 10 years everybody's got a plan to recycle what they don't have is a plan that matches recycling what with what exactly the market wants if, if you're re it doesn't matter how you're producing let's say a rare permanent magnet you must produce rare permanent magnet alloy to a specification and all i read about in these recycling uh, announcements is well they they manage to separate 90 percent of of the rare earths from each other uh, in the magnet. That would be the Pennsylvania one you just cited. Or, or, or the United States government having spent $100 trillion to produce five cents worth of disposal. Something like that. I read this all the time. Okay. The, the end users don't care how they get the material. We care because we, we found out we can't afford to do much in the way of new production from new mines is too expensive. We haven't that hasn't yet ended, but these 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 junior ventures are sorting themselves out rapidly by price, cost. The only issue that matters is cost of 
producing the material. Recycling takes advantage of the fact that the energy and the reagents used to extract these materials from the ground, separate them and purify them, have already been used. What you, you don't have to do anywhere near as much cost. You don't have to put nearly as much cost into a material to recycle it as you did originally to, to get it out of the ground and, and produce it in a useful form. It is obviously the default way to get some material, at least we should be recycling everything we can. This would, would obviously reduce our dependence on, uh, let's say, insecure foreign sources and on sources in our own countries that are too damn expensive to develop. So re recycling's time is here, but somebody with business sense has to get into that, not just announcements from laboratories. Please, I can't stand any more of them. There are already too many of them. Let's just do this. Let's let's get some businessmen involved. Same thing as I've been saying about junior mining for years. Forget all the announcements. Let's produce something. And if you can't make it for less than the other guy, you better find something else to do for a living. Well, speaking of getting some uh, savvy business players involved, mm. um, with Great Western, I, <laughs> I'm very surprised we haven't heard an announcement about who has uh, taken over or tried to acquire uh, less common metals or LCM. Well, I actually know something about that, but... Um, Let's put it this way. LCM turns out to have liabilities far exceeding its asset value. So that uh, if you go to acquire LCM, it turns out you're, you're going to have to take on these liabilities. When you add those numbers together, uh, it doesn't work out. So I don't know if anybody's going to buy LCM, but whoever it is had better have deep pockets. Well, speaking of that, because I, I, I have one more <clears throat> item with regards to Great Western and LCM, for instance. Yeah. Um, as you know, or as we know in the industry, there are very few people that understand uh, rare earth elements uh, in general, including yeah. many of the individuals in the industry, because it's quite complex. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, in lieu of that, it's my understanding yeah. that some of our top, most talented professionals in the industry with real experience, qualifiable and quantifiable experience, are uh, presently on the payroll or were on the payroll for LCM. Who do you think or who do you recommend uh, might want to pick that, uh, that group up or uh, do you have any ideas on this, Jack? LCM's problem has been and continues to be sourcing raw materials. Like everyone else, at the end of the day, they have to get them from China, and that that is obviously a game in control of the Chinese. Who, whoever picks up LCM has got to be somebody that has a source of material for, for them to process. I believe that they have always been in, input material limited. That's why they only produce a relatively small amount compared to their capacity, because it's all they can produce. I hate to say this, but I, I would almost bet uh, your money that, that, in fact, probably a Chinese company will pick it up as a Western outpost. That's my thought. Or, or Japanese. But the Chinese, have, I think, are, are, are more likely to do it. Well, I have to say that your response is very uh, consistent with the information and feedback that I'm receiving. And I think just on uh, one final note, uh, we're starting to see a lot of uh, M&A deals. They're just starting to happen now in the resource yeah. industry. And as you know, this sector has been uh, quite challenged and depressed now for the last couple yeah. of years. But yes. I've noticed we haven't had any M&A deals yet in the rare earth industry. I think that's because the uh, the people who have control of the, of the, let's say, moribund juniors want too much money for them. And I believe money is just sitting on the sidelines waiting. Uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right. There'll be, there'll be a consolidation uh, in the very near term because that's the only way to reach a, an operating threshold where, you, where somebody can be profitable. Of course, with everything that's happened with Molycor, there are a lot of rumors in the uh, U.S. retail market. We're getting a lot of comments and a lot of emails with people yep. basically believing that the entire industry is bottomed out and there's no industrial metal strategy for North America as a result of losing Molycor because <laughs> Molycor had a very good marketing team that, that did 
factor prominently in this industry. Uh, can you correct this notion or this, this misguided yeah. conclusion uh, well, once and for all so I can just send everybody a link to your answer? I, I, I'm trying to avoid the uh, snark. But let's put it this way. Molycorp was great at selling Molycorp. They weren't so good at producing and selling rare earths. They have not ever been a factor in the actual supply of, of rare earths in the global market. So being there or not being there makes very little difference. The most they ever produced last year was 5,000 tons net uh, refined in China and Estonia uh, out of uh, over 100,000 tons. So if they disappear tomorrow, which is very likely, what, as, as an American presidential candidate might say, what difference does it make? Well, as always, thank you so much for joining us today, Jack. Thank you, Tracy, and, and I, I look forward to our next interview.